Hello, everyone. I am your host, John Red, and welcome to the second part of Dyatlov Pass Case File. I hope that you enjoyed first part of this video. If you haven't watched it yet, then please watch it first, as it covers a lot of unique material which is not part of this episode. So, without any further delays, let's continue from where we left our first video. The remaining four bodies of the hikers were not discovered for the next two months. When the snow started melting in May, a Mansi native named Kirikov with his dog noticed some branches that were laid down in the form of a trail. Following these branches, at a distance of 50 meters from cedar tree, he found black cotton sweatpants and left half of a woman's light brown wool sweater. This sweater belonged to Lyudmila Dubinina. Lyudmila wore two sweaters and two long sleeve shirts. The brown sweater she was wearing belonged to Yuri Krivonoshenko and later found to be radioactive. She was laying on a natural ledge with water flowing over her open mouth. There were claims in the media that her tongue was ripped or eaten by something, but her autopsy report simply mentions that the tongue is missing, along with hypoglossal muscle and the muscles of the floor of the mouth. It's a bit strange that her autopsy isn't that detailed like the others, and there are no further explanations on this statement, although it mentions that around 100 grams of dark brown mucosal mass was found in her stomach. This is often quoted as coagulated blood and is used by some as an indication that the heart was beating and the blood was flowing when the tongue was removed from the mouth. Her cause of death was stated as hemorrhage into right atrium of the heart, multiple fractured ribs, and internal bleeding. Medical examination also showed that she was not sexually active at the time of death. This was only stated because whoever did the crime did not sexually assault the girls. Semyon Zolotaryov Semyon was wearing two hats, scarf, two shirts, a sweater, and a coat when his body was found. It was clear that he did not die of cold in that den. His lower body was also protected with a pair of socks and a pair of warm leather handmade shoes known as burka. These were enough for keeping him alive. Additionally, he also had camera around his neck, and this camera came as complete surprise to the Yuri Yudin. As per his knowledge, team had only four cameras, and now a fifth camera had turned up on the body. Unfortunately, melting water had damaged the film, but still, this question lingered as to why he left the tents with a camera, and why did he take two cameras to the trip? One camera was used on a daily basis, and everybody saw it, and it was found in the tent, and but the other one was only found after his death. The question remains that what did he capture on the slope of the mountain that day? He was also holding a pen and small notepad in his hands. One of the rescuers recalls that Colonel Ordyurkov grabbed the notepad and looked at it, cursed, and said, he's written nothing. To this day, he seems to be the only person who had seen this notepad, and it was never filed in evidence or seen by anyone else. Both Semyon and Lyudmila had interesting pattern of injuries. They were similar in direction and force, despite differences in shape, height, and body composition of the two. This would suggest that whatever caused these injuries was a uniform event. On Lyudmila, the multiple fracture of the ribs was bilateral and symmetrical, while on Simeon, it was on one side. They both had hemorrhaging into the cardiac muscle and into the pleural cavity, which means that they both were alive when injured, and this happened as a result of the action of large force. But none of the soft tissue of the chest was damaged. Such wounds are very similar to the type of the trauma that results from a shockwave of a bomb. After these injuries, Lyudmila could have been conscious for 10 to 20 minutes. Semyon could have lived for longer. Alexander Kolevatov Body of Alexander was well insulated. He was protected by two shirts, two sweaters, and ski jacket, which was unbuttoned and unzipped. This was again a strange finding for a person who had supposedly died of cold and hypothermia. The waistband of his sweater and lower parts of his trousers were later tested radioactive. His autopsy report was also silent on the nature of his injuries. His nose was broken, and he had a deformed neck along with an open wound behind his ear, which could be the result of a fight. On the other hand, it could also be caused by natural elements. The snapped back and blow behind the ear are a common sign of killing, performed by special forces. However, we can't be sure about this as autopsy report did not specify any more details, and we are left guessing about the nature and origin of these injuries. 
Nikolai Thibault Brino. Body of Nikolai was well protected against coldness of Siberian winter, as he and Semyon might have been outside of the tent when this mysterious threat struck them. This explains why both of them were wearing hiker shoes and several layers of clothes and were much better dressed when they were forced to abandon their tent. He was wearing woolen hats, two shirts, wool sweaters, and a fur jacket along with woolen gloves. And he was wearing woolen socks along with a pair of felt Valenki boots, which are perfect for Siberian winter. Cadaveric spots were discovered on the back of his upper body and upper extremities. He had a deep, depressed, multi-splintered fracture. Medical examiner excluded an accidental fall on the rock as a possible cause for such a massive and unusual fracture, and stated that, I don't believe these injuries could have been the result of Nikolai simply falling from the level of his own heights, for example, falling and hitting his head. This kind of injury could have only occurred if he had been thrown into the air and hit his head against the rocks. Lack of damage to the soft tissue showed that he could not have been hit by a rock in someone's hand. After this severe concussion, he could not have been able to move and could only be carried or dragged and might have shown signs of life for two to three hours. Now, let's analyze few of the most important aspects of this case, starting from the tent. The tent is the most important piece of evidence in the chain of events. This is where the tragedy started to unravel. The sides of the tent were cut from inside, and hikers chose to exit the tent through sides while completely ignoring the entrance of the tent. At that time, it was only thought that during the night, someone surprised and attacked the hikers after cutting the tent. One of the investigators, while recalling the incident, stated that major breakthrough in the case was made by accident when a woman who was called to repair his uniform took one look at the tent and with confidence said that the tent was cut from inside. Later, forensic analysts confirmed that the tent was indeed cut from inside. According to the forensic report, campsite consisted of a pad of flattened snow. On the bottom are stacked eight pairs of skis for tent support and insulation. Tent is stretched on poles and fixed with ropes. At the bottom of the tent, nine backpacks were discovered with various personal items, jackets, boots, warm fur coats, stove, axes, saw, blankets, food, and cameras. The nature and form of all cuts suggested that they were formed by contact with a canvas inside of the tent with the blade of some weapon, presumably a knife. Some of the cuts from inside didn't make it all the way through. The satirical propaganda leaflet named Evening Oterton was found near the entrance of the camp. It was put together by the hikers on the night of incidents. It just shows that the morale of hikers was high, and they took time to write it. Here is the translation from this leaflet. In recent years, there has been a heated debate about existence of Yeti. According to recent reports, Yeti lives in the northern Ural, near Mounts or Torton. This innocent reference would later give birth to so many of the Yeti theories. The entrance of the tent was in direction of south, while north part was covered with 15 to 20 centimeters of snow. From the density and appearance of the snow, it was concluded that it was formed not due to any avalanche, rather was formed by wind. A pair of their skis were sticking out from the snow. In case of any avalanche, they cannot remain like this. Near the entrance of the tent in the snow was an ice axe and Dyatlov's jacket. It was strange that Dyatlov took off his jacket outside of the tent. On the side of the tent, on top of 10 centimeters of snow, rescuers also found Dyatlov's flashlight in working condition. One of the rescuers said that, We couldn't understand why the snow under the flashlight was 10 centimeters thick, yet there wasn't any on the flashlight itself. As the rescuers did not expect the hikers to be dead at this point, so they did not make any attempts to preserve or record footprints of people around the Dyatlov Pass. It is still an open discussion as to how many people were really there in the pass on that day. But from testimony of rescuers and available photographs, we can estimate that there were definitely eight to nine tracks of footprints left by hikers who were not wearing any footwear. Their footprints left characteristic columns of pressed snow with footprints on top. Members of the group all walked in a single file with a tall man walking in the back. Overall, it was an organized, uneventful descent. Several trails would deviate from the general direction, but eventually would rejoin the group. There were other footprints also discovered and photographed, 
but nobody knows if they were left by someone else or rescuers themselves. In the end, after reading through all of the information available on the tent, I have reached this conclusion that they left without outer clothes, shoes, and gloves. Only a threat of exceptional danger would force a group of nine young and physical fit people to leave their shelter in a winter evening into a completely uninhabited forest. I think whatever they faced, it meant an immediate death in the tents or going down the hill without their survival equipment. They had left three axes and three finished knives in the tents and whatever the danger they faced, they did not seem it fit to confront it with axes and knives. They left their tents without any of the essential clothing that would help them survive Siberian winter, and they did not go down in the direction of their storage site, but rather went for the forest on the opposite side. Their storage seemed undisturbed. Now, let's take a look at another important aspect of this case. The cedar tree. Bodies of first two hikers were found at a distance of 1.5 kilometers from their tents. Looking around the area carefully, Rescuers found a flat area next to the cedar, and there, they found remains of the fire. Bodies of hikers were found at a distance of 2-3 meters from this fire. From accounts of multiple rescuers, we see that all of them observed the same facts. One of the rescuers said that, Next to the bodies was a fire. Nearby were more than 10 small fir tree branches, cut with a finished knife. The lower dry branches, of about 5 centimeters diameter, had been cut from the cedar. Some of these were lying next to the fire. The snow around was trampled. Captain Chernyshov stated that, it's possible to conclude that other people had since been by the fire. We found various garments next to it rather than on the bodies, but we didn't find any other bodies. The trees near the fire had been cut with knives, but we found no knives with the bodies. Maslenikov stated that, maybe with the help of others, they had made a pretty good fire with the branches of fir trees, and those branches had been burning for maybe an hour and a half. Eight centimeter branches of cedar had burned through. The tall cedar tree also held some clues about the events of the night. Captain Chernyshov stated that, all the low branches of the cedar within arm's reach were broken completely. One was cut four or five meters high. They were thick. These types of branches are extremely difficult to break, even if, for instance, you hang on them with the whole weight of your body. At Manike stated that, most of the dry branches up to five meters were broken. Beside this, the side of the tree facing the slope and the tents was completely cleared of branches. These were not dry, they were young and were not used. Some of them were just lying on the ground and the others were hanging on the lower branches of the cedar. It looked as if someone had created a viewing height facing the site from where they came. After analyzing all of the details that are available on the cedar tree, I have reached the conclusion that the hikers had expected the same danger to approach them here also. To keep an eye on approaching danger from the tents, they climbed the cedar and only cleared all the branches facing in the direction of tents. These cuttings were not meant for burning, but were just hanging from the cut-off tops. Also, from the trampled snow, it seemed that more than two people engaged in a great effort to gather woods for protection which indicates that after descending from the hill, at one time, all of them were together around this fire, and then something, or someone, also surprised them here, which made the team split. Two of the hikers climbed the cedar, and remaining hikers fled deeper into the woods. These two tried their best to stay on the tree for as long as possible. Krivonoshenko bit his own hand in desperation to get any response, but probably, due to exhaustion and freezing temperatures, could not stay on the tree any longer and fell from the tree. This fall proved deadly for Doroshenko, as gray foaming liquid was found on his cheek, while Krivonoshenko landed in or near the fire and burned his socks and parts of his body. After falling to the ground, he also could not move due to exhaustion and hypothermia and later died not too far from the fire. Once the danger seemed to have passed, their teammates returned and after finding them dead, laid down their bodies with respect and divided their clothes among each other. Dyatlov and two of the hikers decided to go back to their camp for more supplies. On their journey back to the camp, the same danger also approached them, which explains injuries to the Dyatlov's hands and fracture to Rustam's skull. The remaining four hikers who had ventured back into the forest and started digging up a den to protect themselves from the freezing winds. Now, let's take a look at the den in detail. Until now, the investigators were still considering this incident as freezing to death. 
although some of the details were raising questions. Doroshenko had pulmonary edema and contusion as a result of blunt trauma. To stifle a cry, or to stay on the tree, Krivonoshenko in desperation had bitten a piece of his own hand and had third degree burns that cannot be sustained if one simply falls asleep if still alive. Dyatlov vomiting blood and Zenaida had baton shaped bruise on her waist. Rustam's skull trauma could not be attributed to clumsiness or disorientation. Somebody hit him on the head. Also, there were questions of why the knife that was used to cut the branches could not be found. Still, nobody was suspecting a foul play. The bodies found in the den changed the whole course of investigation. On one hand, the hikers showed that they were sane enough to do anything in their power to survive. But on the other hand, it still did not make sense as to why their attempts did not work. The den was made by surviving hikers and it would provide them good protection against cold winds. As Semyon had served in the army, so it was probably his idea. This was a common way to survive winters at the fronts, and in their situation, it offered the best chance of survival. Here again, the theory of paradoxical undressing did not make sense, as hikers laid out cedar branches in the den to avoid contact with cold snow underneath. Lyudmila by that time was wearing radioactive sweater and pants out of Krivonoshenko. However, the case became even more strange when their bodies were discovered. All three members were crushed with immense force, and their bodies were not found in the den, but at a distance of few feet away. Alexander was trying to protect Semyon's body, and Thibault's body was at a distance of 30 centimeters in the downstream. Only Colonel Ordyukov had seen the notepad found on their bodies, and its whereabouts are still unknown. One of the key rescuers, named Vladimir Asgnadzi, also stated that he felt strongly about those in charge were not really interested in a proper investigation and already had a theory. The whole operation was rushed, atmosphere was quite tensed, and everyone was waiting for answers, and someone from Moscow was pushing for a speedy investigation. Once the bodies had been taken out of the den, helicopter pilots refused to take the bodies, citing that it was out of their official duties. It has been said that they had already suspected the bodies to be poisoned or radioactive and did not want them on the helicopter. The crew further demanded that the bodies be covered in zinc coffins. At this point, Colonel Ordyukov took his pistol and threatened to shoot the crew on sight. Vladimir Asknadze intervened and bodies were repacked and finally lifted for the transportation. After going through all of the evidence available on the den, I have reached the conclusion that after digging the den, the four skiers were temporarily out of the way of freezing winds. They were also well dressed enough to keep them alive. Their bodies were discovered at a distance of few feet from the den, which to me indicates that they ventured out of their den to look for the three friends, who had decided to go back to the tent. After finding their friends dead, they decided to return to their den, but then, something or someone again struck them. Bodies of three of them were almost crushed by that force and made it difficult for them to move, and they died within minutes of receiving these injuries. Now, Let's take a look at one more important aspect of this investigation. Radioactive contamination. Claims made in the media state that some of the hikers' clothing was found to be highly radioactive. Examinations of these clothes were done by the main radiologist at Sverdlask. After rinsing the clothes in a cold running water for three hours, the contamination was decreased between 30 and 60%. This contamination could not have been possible under normal circumstances. The normal contamination level of beta particles form 150 centimeters squared is around 5,000 beta particles per minute. Dubonina's brown sweater had a decay rate of 9,900 beta particles per minute. The sweater from Kolevatov had a value of 5,600 beta particles per minute. And the trouser had a contamination level of 5,000 beta particles per minute. The radiologist concluded that either the clothes were contaminated from radioactive dust or they became contaminated by coming in direct contact of radioactive substances. He also stated that the actual level of contamination of some parts of clothes was many times more, and we must also consider the fact that the clothes had been washed in the running water of ravine with differing degrees of intensity. I think the most logical explanation of radioactivity is that these clothing items belonged to Alexander and Krivonoshenko, and both of them had directly worked at nuclear power plants and nuclear fuel enrichment facilities before, and therefore had this contamination from their jobs. This seems to be one of those points which has been overblown in the media, but in reality, 
I do not find it odd that the only slightly radioactive clothing items belong to the people who are already working for nuclear facilities. If you have watched the video until this point, then please, do check out the next part of this video, where I would go into the details of possible explanations of this whole incident. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment for more such content. Stay healthy, stay safe. See you next time.